Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Mark introduces you to some of the world's leading creative talent from publishing, film, music, restaurants, medical research, and more. You'll discover how to tap into your most original thinking, how to organize your ideas, and most of all, how to make the connections and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Mark Stenson. Today, our creative road trip is taking us down Interstate 49, about halfway down the state between Shreveport and New Orleans, to Alexandria, Louisiana. And we're going to be talking with our guest, Wayne Mullins. Wayne, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm looking forward to it. You know, not a lot of people have taken I-49 down the middle of the state like I have. So it's good to talk to one of my native Louisianans. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Often, you know, when people hear Louisiana, they think New Orleans. And I say, okay, picture New Orleans, picture all the thoughts and the sights and sounds that come to mind. Now picture the polar opposite. Yeah. And that is Alexandria, <laughs> Louisiana. That's right. Yeah. There's not the kind of, uh, what should I call it? Frivolity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that, you know, just as good a food and uh, the crawfish is plentiful. Well, Wayne's company is called Ugly Mug Marketing. And I didn't know what to expect, uh, Wayne, but you're not as ugly as I expected. And so, uh, and your work is even more beautiful. So it's great to talk to you. Well, thank you. That means I'm already exceeding expectations. So we're one <laughs> step ahead. Right. Right. Wayne has a, a great marketing company that does social media, web development, uh, video marketing. I guess we're going to get into the creative process in each one of those, but also the kind of clients that you're working with. I was great to see that you've worked across like dozens, if not hundreds of industries and markets. So we'll, we'll talk about the commonalities of those, but also the impact that you're making with, I think it's like over 250,000 entrepreneurs a year impacted by your work in some way. So Wayne, why don't we just start with, you know, the, the creative process across all of those industries. There's got to be a common thread for you. How do you start? How do you look at the challenge of the clients and, and begin where you start? Yeah, great question, Mark. So that, that answer or the answer to that question has shifted and changed over the years. So Ugly Mug Marketing, now we're in about 12 and a half years into this. And very early on, my approach was this, um, the biggest, the craziest ideas that I could possibly get the clients to buy into, that's what I would pursue. And as you can imagine, I experienced a lot of heartache, a lot of frustration in trying to sell these ideas to clients. And so over the years, what I've learned is I first have to learn to explore the edges of the box. In other words, what is their box? Where are the edges that they're, they're comfortable in? And what once I discover those edges, we can then begin pushing just outside of that. And so what I've had to learn over the years is that we have to sometimes temper as creatives. We have to temper the way we pitch and we present. And we have to think of it in terms of small steps. In other words, where we want to take a client, maybe way outside their comfort zone, way outside of their, you know, proverbial box, so to speak. Um, but if we try to jump straight there, we will end up frustrated. They will end up frustrated. And so it's learning to find that box and then begin pushing to the boundaries of that box and then slightly beyond that boundary. And when you're working with them to develop, you know, whatever your form of a creative brief is, that says, you know, this is the direction and the strategy you want to take. What kind of questions are you asking to find those fences? Yeah, absolutely. The first place we start, Mark, is with the actual outcome that they're after. And, you know, believe it or not, when most people come to us, they really don't know what they're after. Um, or they come to us with kind of a disillusioned or a, a, the wrong view of what they're after. And what I mean by that is, let's just take websites, for example. When most people come to us for a website, they really don't know what they want. Typically what happens is a competitor of theirs just got a new website. They look at competitor's website, they look at their website and they're like, man, this is terrible, we gotta do something. And so they pick up the phone and they call and say, you know, our website needs updating, et cetera. So one of the places we begin is what, are we actually after? What is the end product? What is the final result that we're after? And then what we look for, what are the, what are the paths or what are the avenues that would lead us to that outcome? Because once we define, clearly define with them and they buy into that outcome, 
it then gives us permission to offer paths that they may not have otherwise seen or been open to. But until you identify, and it's kind of finding that edge of that box, what is the result that we're after? So if it's a new website and, you know, let's just say it's a consulting company that we're working with, how many inquiries do you want per month coming through that website? Now, once we identify that and we get them to agree and confirm that that is the desired outcome, it then strips away. Like we can then be more creative than normally we may have may have at the outset if we had not first identified that outcome that we were after. Mm, makes a lot of sense. And I guess when clients talk to you about results, you know, what, uh, what kind of ways do they articulate the outcomes that they're looking for? Yeah, it, it's funny, you know, you think about business, typically, um, there's really a handful of outcomes that you would think an entrepreneur or a business owner would want, you know, more sales, more profit, um, more people on their team, more awareness for their brand, whatever those few things may be. Um, but what we discover is when, when people come to us, what they often describe are the symptoms. So they're experiencing some symptoms from a root or underlying problem, and they can't identify, they don't necessarily know how to describe the underlying problem. And so instead, when they talk to us about these results, they're talking symptomatically. Um, in other words, we don't know why, but traffic to our website is down. We don't know why, but you know, overall sales are down. We don't know. So again, it's our job. And I think it's true for really any creative endeavor when you're working with clients is to really get to the root, to the root of what is underlying kind of what's on the surface level. Or in other words, what they're even saying or demonstrating, you have to dig deeper. You have to go layers down often to get to the true problem or the true, true result that they're after. Yeah. And then thinking about your business, Wayne, is, is there a customer persona, if I could use that description? Are, are there certain kinds of clients that seem attracted to the way you work and what you do? Uh, and I guess on the other side, are there clients that you're hoping to gain? Yeah, great question, Mark. It, what I would say is this, for, for years and years and years, I would get advice from, from other entrepreneurs and from coaches that would tell me, you need to pick a niche. You need to pick a niche and you need to go deep in that niche. Um, it would you know, make your life simpler. All your processes would be simplified and streamlined because it's all in one niche, one vertical. And that never appealed to me, right? I love the novelty of working on a, a project for an author right now, you know, this morning, and then this afternoon working on a project for somebody who's in the metal industry. Like, I love the, the flexibility and the ability to work in a variety of industries. But I, I never, so we never niched. But what we finally discovered, like, what is the thing, the common element between all of our clients? And it's this, we work best with growth minded entrepreneurs. Now, that could be for profit, that could be not for profit, but they typically have a, an entrepreneurial mindset and it's growth minded. In other words, they want to push, you know, kind of the, they want to challenge the status quo. They want to push the boundaries a bit um, and they're after growth and whatever that means for them. Mm -hmm. And even in your own business, uh, you said you've been in this uh, 12 plus years. How have you seen that growth trajectory? And, and I assume it's not been a straight line. No, absolutely not, Mark. It's because uh... <laughs> it, it always looks more like the roller coaster line than it does just the straight up edge. <laughs> yeah, that that absolutely right. And you know, for for whatever reason, I think when when people launch into an endeavor, whether that's a business or whether that's a creative project, um, you know, we're initially fueled by our passion, right? So our passion for the thing fuels us. Our passion to be an entrepreneur, our passion for the art project, it fuels us. But at some point what must fuel us if we're going to make quote unquote a business out of it is the marketplace their passion has to be what fuels us at that point in other words we have to shift our passion for their passion our passion is enough to get us going but their passion is required to keep us going particularly when money is involved in this this equation <laughs> exactly and what about any particular i guess obstacles or you know potholes you've experienced over time and how you address those. <laughs> That's a long, long list, Mark. Uh, <laughs> as you said, it is a roller coaster. There have been so many, so many downs, so to speak, uh, using that metaphor. Um, what I would say is this, that, you know, 
the, the ups and downs for me have, have varied everywhere from project management to, um, you know, presentations, making presentations, selling ideas, selling creative ideas to clients, um, to leading a team, um, to financial, you know, mistakes. I mean, it's just been this long list, but, you know, when I, when I think about this journey or really any journey in life, um, I love to use the analogy or I love to think about it using the windshield versus the rear view mirror analogy, right? So when we're in those moments, when we're making those decisions, we're looking through the windshield and we, we think that when we're in those moments, we can see everything clearly, but the reality is that our windshield is often full of smudges. It's full of grime from the road. It's full of, uh, debris and it could be raining, um, and there's traffic and there's all these things coming at us through the windshield that, that blur our vision. Even though when we're sitting there in that moment, we think we clearly see everything that's taking place. But when we look up in the rear view mirror of life or in a project, the rear view mirror is always clean, right? There's no bugs, there's no road debris. The rear view mirror, mirror is clean. And so we're able to pick up the patterns and, and the things that actually took place. And, and so I truly believe that for me, at least, I learned so much more through the failure. I learned so much more through the struggle. That doesn't mean I like it. That doesn't mean I enjoy it. Um, but that's where I believe for creatives, that's where we can, we can you know, look for the things in those moments where we need to stretch and where we need to grow and where we need to push ourselves maybe into some weaknesses that we've ignored or that we've let lay dormant for a long time. It's so interesting. You know, Wayne, as you're talking about that, you know, I think about so many listeners of this podcast, they might be entrepreneurs themselves, but uh, also a lot of maybe solo creative practitioners. And a lot of what you're describing is kind of the, you can't do it alone either. Uh, you know, what, what kind of teammates and collaborators do you like to work with that maybe fill in the gaps of your weaknesses as, as you were describing them? Yeah, so the teammates that I love to work with, um, you know, align with our core values. And I know that's very cliche, um, and that's that's you know the answer that sounds good on on paper, sounds good for somebody listening to this to hear. Um, but the reality is, you know, the word culture when we think about a business or an entity, the word culture comes from the same Latin word um, as cultivate. So when we think of cultivating, we think of the soil, right? Um, you can put a seed in good, healthy soil, and that seed is going to flourish. It's going to turn into something that produces a lot of fruit. You could put that same seed into unhealthy soil, hard soil, and it's not going to produce much fruit, if any. And so like flipping this all the way back around, what I would say is that when we hire people, when we bring people onto our team, we have a culture that is, I hope, representative of our core values. And so I'll just throw one of them out there. One of our core values is people first. So we genuinely believe in putting people over projects, our team members over profits. It's about people first. Um, another one is what we'd call results, not reasons. In other words, we want to deliver results. We don't need a long list of reasons because there's always reasons, right? There's always reasons why we didn't deliver. We didn't hit the goal. We didn't achieve but we're after results, not reasons. Um, you know, and even when I say those core values, for someone listening, they may think, okay, those are, those are you know, fancy buzzwords. They sound great. They probably look great on a big poster somewhere. And, and all of that's true. But for a value to be a value, it must cost you something. So for us to sit here and say that we value people, we put people first. If that's actually not costing us something, through our actions, through our time, through our money, through the profit, then we truly don't value that thing. You know, uh, to throw out just a quick example, um, for most of your listeners, you're probably familiar with Enron, the big company that mm -hmm. no longer exists today. One of Enron's core values was integrity. And so you have to, you have to ask yourself this question, if, if that is what they truly believe, is that, if that is what they valued, would they still be around today, right? Would if the cards unplayed or the cards unfolded the way they did, right? And so for those of you out there who are solopreneurs thinking about growth, thinking about expansion, thinking about adding team members to fulfill weaknesses, begin with your core values, the core values you would be willing to sacrifice for. 
the values that you're willing to pay a price for. Start with that and then recruit team members around those values. Mm -hmm. That's the most important step. And it's interesting you talk about, you know, values costing something, because I do think about the balance that you're describing here, you know, re results, you know, no excuses, and yet people first. So somewhere along the way, we didn't get it done because Sarah had to call in sick, or, you know, uh, Josh had to go coach his little league team. Um, so how do those things clash in the real world? I love your, your example and your story and just thinking about in your company, how, what happens when those two values collide? Yeah, and, and they inevitably will. Um, you know, there's, there's often in so many areas of our lives, this dichotomy, right? So there's this great quote from this company called Zingerman's up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it basically says that your strengths will always lead to your weaknesses. Your strengths will always lead to your weaknesses. And so that that's really kind of underlying what you're talking about here. So on the one hand, we say people first. And so the little league soccer game comes up, but yet the big project is here you know, do and the results are due on this date. And so what that means for us is, you know, one, we're, we're about ownership in all areas of our life, not just in work. So what that means is owning the fact that A, you have to go coach, but also owning the fact you have to get results. So then we work through how do you delegate? Who do you delegate? Who can step up for you? How do we get this accomplished? So again, it does cost because what that cost is, that means you're going to have to ask a teammate who's already got a full schedule to step up and fill in for you. Or, you know, so those scenarios unfold in that manner, in that way. So it, it always cost. Mm -hmm. Well, and Wayne, I myself have lived and worked in uh, many cities. Uh, and I think about when clients might be considering a partner like your company, you know, uh, the address Alexandria, Louisiana doesn't necessarily always come up as a creative, you know, Mecca and hotbed, but yet you attract, you know, a clientele uh, from all over. What, what do you credit that to? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a tricky question, but I would answer it this way, and it's going to seem very cliche, but I believe that, you know, any small business or really any business probably for that matter, um, your best clients come through or from word of mouth, from referrals. And so, you know, not to dive into marketing, but when you think of marketing, most marketers think about the attraction side of marketing. In other words, more customers, more customers, more customers in through the door. But the reality is marketing is about more than just attraction. Marketing, when done correctly, is about keeping and turning customers into evangelists. And so what I would say is that um, we have been extremely intentional and we have sacrificed a lot when we couldn't afford to sacrifice a lot to go above and beyond for our clients to turn ordinary customers into evangelists at sometimes very, very significant cost. Um, and that is how we have ended up with clients literally from around the world. Um, and our clientele has grown substantially in terms of who we're able to work with. Um, I can't reveal the information now. It's not officially public yet, but we just finished um, launching, doing all the marketing behind the scenes for an author whose book just debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and so, you know, this person's in California, we're here in Louisiana, but all of this has happened because of a core value, because of belief about putting people first, a belief that says we're going to sacrifice for results for our clients. We're going to make those investments. So that's a long answer to your short question, but yeah. that's how we've done it. No, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess, you know, you're also uh, describing that many of the traditional barriers, like does your address really matter kind of thing that, you know, you can attract in a much wider, almost unlimited radius than you could before. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. If you, if you need evidence of that, just drive through Alexandria, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Wayne, what a great discussion. First, before I uh, wrap up here, I want to make sure people know where to find you and how to connect with your work. Absolutely, Mark. The easiest place is just our website, uglymugmarketing.com. Uh, all of our social channels are there. My email address is there. Phone numbers are there. So that's the one-stop shop. 
Yes. Well, we've definitely been looking in the rearview mirror. We've talked a little bit about the windshield, but now I want to go all the way, you know, to the over over the hill and uh, your strategic GPS. Where where do you think this journey is taking you next, Wayne? Yeah, Mark, you know, I wish I had some profound, wise answer for you here. <laughs> or or um, some like crystal ball vision. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, for us, it's about what I call micro progression. So the goal is that each day we're a little bit better. And again, that's easy to say. That's very hard to do. And the reason that that's hard to do is because we often don't measure, right? So we don't know how good we are today because we don't have measurements in place. And that is true for, for almost any area of our lives, Mark. So, you know, you could ask me, you know, how are you, how are you doing Wayne as a husband to your wife, Heather? And I could sit here and tell you, Mark, I'm doing great. We have, you know, great marriage. I'm, I'm, I'm you, you look up the dictionary, perfect husband. That's me, right? There's my picture. But if you ask my wife, Heather, that question, and she said, well, you know, Wayne hadn't been home for dinner the last week. He, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever this list is. And so, I think sometimes for us, particularly as creatives, um, we can we can often beat up ourselves, right? We can um, look at our work and believe it's not worthy enough, believe it's not creative enough. All these all these things that <laughs> run through our heads. But the other side of that equation is this: we need those people in our lives who we trust, who we know have our our best interests at heart, who are willing to push us and prod us in the direction that we're heading. In other words, where we're trying to go. So I, I, I'm a firm believer in accountability. I'm a firm believer in with people who genuinely care about you, surrounding you, that you can make each day better. Well, that's a goal for all of us to take on. So thanks for sharing that uh, personal insight. Well, listeners, what a terrific conversation. And I just wanted to thank Wayne Mullins from Ugly Mug Marketing for being our guest. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks so much, Mark. And come back again next time for our next episode of Unlocking Your World of Creativity. We're going to continue our around the world journey to talk to creatives, practitioners, artists of all kinds about where they get inspired, how they organize their ideas, and most of all, gaining the confidence and the connections to get your work up and out into the world. I'm Mark Stenson. We've been unlocking your world of creativity, and we'll see you next time. Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media, creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and thepeaceroom.love. We've created a special offer just for listeners of the podcast. You can get the book, A World of Creativity, for a special price of $5.98 for paperback. And the Kindle version is only 99 cents. Go to mark-stinson.com to take advantage of this special offer. Our podcast is supported by Adobe and the Adobe Creative Cloud, the world's best creative app and services, so you can make almost anything you can imagine wherever you're inspired. We use Adobe to help make this podcast, using Audition, Premiere Rush, InDesign, and more. So join the creative community with the Adobe Creative Cloud, and let's make something better unlocking your world of creativity.